Ukraine stands on the brink of disaster. After losing the Crimea Peninsula to Russian annexation, it now faces losing control of its eastern regions in a struggle with pro-Russian separatists. We were in Kiev for what turned out to be the last days of the Euromaidan revolution that toppled President Viktor Yanukovych. The police had locked down the city after a day of deadly clashes that had left over 30 dead. When we arrived in Kiev, the protesters had been pushed back to their last lines of defence on the Maidan. Things were desperate and it looked like this could be the end of the resistance. However, it was clear that they weren't going to give up the square without a fight. There's still a little bit of fighting between the cops and the protesters, fireworks going in one direction and the police shooting the water cannon the other, which is fucking hell, that was huge. This is the new barricade line. Beyond that is another line of tyres that the protesters are set on fire to separate themselves from the police. We're only a few feet beyond that. It was difficult to predict what would happen next, but no one could have imagined the horror of the following day. The next morning, the uneasy standoff was broken when police started using live rounds on the protesters. So we headed down to the square to investigate. We're back through the barricades, going towards the square. This is Krushatik Street. Behind me is the reoccupied city hall. A number of police have been captured in earlier clashes. The truce was uh, broken this morning. Apparently 20 or so policemen have been captured by the protesters. People are shouting shame at them as they're being like, dragged into the new city hall. People are really, really angry. Some of them are trying to punch, spitting on them. Ambulances are coming through. Apparently there's a lot of wounded at the square now. The police were opening fire on protesters earlier today, apparently. These two men were just brought in. Colours completely drained out of them. Completely lifeless. I think today might be a very bloody day. It was clear now that the police were opening fire on the protesters. People were shaken by what they were seeing and afraid that this could be the start of an even deadlier crackdown. People are saying that there's a sniper on a building overlooking the Institute Sky Street behind me. Everyone's sort of gathered on this corner trying to take cover from the sniper. So those are live ammunition rounds. Kalashnikov, where bullets have gone through their shields. I mean, they're tough, but they won't stop a bullet. The sniper has apparently got a view across Institute Sky Street. More and more protesters are venturing out now, trying to keep fueling the fire and building those barricades at the front there. We're not exactly sure which building the sniper is in, but so quite frankly, any of us here could get hit. With so many conflicting reports, it was difficult to tell what had actually happened. Later that day though, videos surfaced of police mercilessly opening fire on the largely unarmed protesters. Uh, the guy who was uh, standing right to him was shot in the head. Sniper. Sniper. It's pretty grim. You see patches of blood all over the place. A bit of what looks like skin, brain matter or something. No, most of the Berkut soldiers were taken from Crimea. Very Russian areas. Yes, yes. Yeah. There is a lot of uh, propaganda there. They think that this is like some holy fight against Nazism. So they bring the police from there because they're afraid that police from here will be... Uh, Sympathetic. Yes, yes. Will not uh, shoot the people. On the other side of Institutska Street, the protesters were desperately building barricades to provide more cover from the snipers and there was a constant fear that the police might counter-attack in greater numbers. We think there's at least two snipers covering this area, so uh, it's, it's very risky to be out in the open. Wooden shields like that aren't going to help them. 
We're here in front of Hotel Ukraina that overlooks Independence Square. Early on this morning when clashes began, it started being used as a triage centre for the wounded. Apparently inside there are a number of dead bodies, and mostly from gunshot wounds. The most horrible thing what we saw from the balcony, we could not believe our eyes because we saw that an army or military or soldiers, they shoot a man with a gun. Then they took this corpse, this dead body, and threw them into the fire. My hands were trembling because I, I didn't see that before in my life. So most of the people you've treated, are, are they suffering from gunshot wounds? Yes, it's gunshots and bullets. We were taken out from the wounds. In case if we were shot through the head, lungs, heart, we could not help. Although the death toll was rising, the protesters were not falling back. If anything, the deaths were spurring them on and they couldn't afford to let down their fallen comrades. So, uh, so eight of the, those killed this morning in the clashes with police are now lined up here and protesters are coming to pay their respects. More and more, this looked like the desperate last act of a government losing control. At the moment, it's just very difficult to find out how many exactly have been killed today. Some are saying 100, some are saying 30. A nurse said earlier that 21 bodies were brought here. There are a number of other bodies behind me waiting to be loaded into the truck. Some of the protesters are keeping their personal details on them, so in case something happened to them, their family would be able to find out. Some, however, didn't, so some of these bodies are at the moment unidentified and uh, the families possibly don't know what's happened to them. So it's very, very sad. This day will go down in history in Ukraine. Overnight, the violence had abated, protesters had strengthened their positions and the police had secured the parliament district. Okay, so to the right of me are maybe close to a 50, 60 cops, a lot of them armed with AK-47s. They ask not to film. Okay. Yanukovych was desperately trying to broker a deal to cling on to power, but protesters clearly wanted nothing less than his full resignation. As the day wore on and funerals had started to take place in front of thousands on the square, it was becoming clear that Yanukovych's days were numbered. The previous day's slaughter had made martyrs and heroes out of those killed, and the mood on the crowd was defiant and confident as ever. As the funerals took place on the Maidan, the police melted away from their positions outside Parliament as part of the ongoing negotiations between the government and the opposition, leaving some of their vehicles up for grabs. People aren't happy with the negotiations that were brokered earlier. Some are even saying they may storm Parliament tomorrow by 10 a.m. if Yanukovych hasn't stepped down. The protesters didn't know it yet, but victory was theirs. After four months of bloody struggle, Yanukovych finally fled the country in face of overwhelming public opposition. Він вже втік, хлопці, його вже нема в країні. 
Yesterday, the police pulled back all their forces uh, because of this truce agreement that's been signed with the opposition and the government. So this is the, uh, the front door to the Ukrainian parliament, the RADA, and instead of police out the front, we've got Euromaidan protesters. Inside the building, there's a session with the MPs, and they're talking about putting through a law to impeach the president of this country. So what do you hope to happen next? I hope that we will have another government, another better president, because Yanukovych wasn't my president. Inside Parliament, MPs were busy trying to form a new government, setting dates for new presidential elections and voting to change back to the 2004 Constitution. <laughs> легитимизировать нынешнюю так сказать, власть, поскольку так сказать, кабинет министров сейчас не, не, не работает, президент находится неизвестно где. Ну, есть три варианта Януковича, когда он сам лично подает в отставку. Второй вариант, когда против него открывается уголовное дело, как о человеке и должностной фигуре, который нарушил Конституцию Украины. И э, третий вариант – Который, о котором бы вообще не хотел говорить, это когда стихия просто, это стихия предрекает ему судью Чаушеску. Whilst we were in there, the MPs inside voted to immediately release the former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko from prison in Kharkiv. Yulia Tymoshenko co-led the Orange Revolution in 2004, later becoming Ukraine's first female Prime Minister. After losing the 2010 presidential election to Viktor Yanukovych, Tymoshenko was jailed for 10 years for embezzlement of state funds and abuse of power. Her imprisonment was largely seen as political by her supporters and Western leaders. People are still, I think, quite surprised that they're in control of the parliament building and that they've effectively won, but it didn't take any extra bloodshed. You know, I think there was the uh, expectation that they might have to fight some more but it just didn't happen, you know. Hundreds of people have died over the past week. I think that's part of the reason why we're not seeing lots of people driving around, screaming and shouting, and it's, it's a very sad, somber atmosphere still. So we're here on the Grushevskovo Street. Behind us, uh, Yulia Tymoshenko, the former JLPM, has come down to lay some flowers at one of the spots where a protest was killed. After laying flowers at Grushevskovo, Yulia headed toward the Maidan to speak to the tens of thousands who'd gathered to hear her speak. <laughs> Коли я заїхала в Київ, я Київ не впізнала. Спалені машини, барикади, квіти. Але це інша Україна. Це Україна вільних людей. І тому люди, які були на Майдані, які загинули на Майдані, це герої на віка. It had been a monumental day for Ukraine. Yanukovych had fled to the eastern city of Kharkiv, isolated as his party disintegrated around him, and at least 60 people were thought to have been killed. The revolution had achieved its aims, but the protesters on the Maidan had paid a heavy price. As parliament was taken, Ukraine turned its attention to the ultimate symbol of Yanukovych's corruption, Mezhagiria. 
his huge, sprawling private estate on the edge of Kiev. We're on our way to Mizhigiria. Two days ago, the protesters took it over and have been opening it up to the public. It's obviously quite a huge draw. You've got thousands of cars queuing the road, people basically parking their car here and walking. Mezhigiria covers 350 acres of land, costs hundreds of millions of euros to build, has a golf course, a spa, and even a private zoo. It's a gold leaf gate. I mean, there's nothing about this place that's been done on the cheap. It's so massive, I mean, it even looks kind of like a weird dictatorship theme park. Could you tell us where we are right now? This is his private residence, okay. so nobody was allowed um, to go in. This was a top secret place. How did you guys come to control Mezhigiria? When there were main battles on Maidan, yeah. then you could just flee from Mezhigiria. Okay. And this, the guard just flew away. You could just walk straight in. Yeah, exactly. Got its own lift system. How many floors is it, Alex? Um, five floors. Five floors. Wow. So well, this is the main room. Wow. In this <laughs> building. This kind of takes the piss, really. This is the main office of Yanukovych. Okay. Wow. Pretty grand. This is a special connection with all the ministers. So he could call the parliament Just directly from here. Put a button. Attack my dumb, attack my dumb <laughs> bastards, we're losing. Big time. <laughs> Seems to be a fan of weapons of any he kind. He's a fan of weapons. Yeah. Mauser bullets, Magnum bullets, Winchesters. He was actually a big shooting fan. So when you guys are working for 200 euros a month and your president lives in a place like this, how does that make you feel? You saw it. Yeah. You were my done. What's going to happen to Mezhigiria? People's self-defense at some point will give Mezhigiria to the state okay. because it belongs to people. And we hope this will be the first in the world museum, in a, uh, museum of corruption. As the protesters explored the grounds, they came across hundreds of folders floating in the river. Evidence that someone working for Yanukovych had tried and failed to dispose of what turned out to be some very incriminating documents. We met with Natalie Sedletska, a journalist who spent time living in Mezhigiria, drying out and investigating the documents that tied President Yanukovych to fraud, corruption and possibly even attempted murder. OK, it was here. Yeah, activists were informed that there are documents just floating in the Kyiv Sea. This is an artificial reservoir. And so they invited professional divers. Oh, really? It was cold, you know, and <laughs> they were diving in and bringing up all documents to here. But they were originally trying to burn them. They call this house Putin House because <laughs> it is said that when he was visiting Yanukovych, he stayed in this house. All oh, right, so this is like... Putin's pad. Yeah, so we tried not to sleep in these pads. <laughs> the document shed light on a complicated money laundering scheme that funneled state funds into Yanukovych's pockets through a shell company called Tantalit. They also showed how he was able to spend 30 million euros on only six light fittings through bank accounts in his son's name linked to Tantalit. Not only was there evidence of financial crimes, but other documents showed a much darker side to Yanukovych's reign. In December 25th, um, journalist Tatiana Chernovol was hardly beaten. She was one of the main enemies of Yanukovych because she was investigating Mezhigiria so hard, she was even jumping through the fence before everybody else did that. <laughs> On the evening of the 25th of December, unidentified men rammed Chernovil's car off the road outside of Kiev. Her attackers then beat her until she was unrecognisable and left her to die in a ditch in the middle of the freezing Ukrainian winter. Luckily, she survived and claimed she was attacked for her investigations into the rampant government corruption. <laughs> So, in the notepad of the head of security service of Yanukovych, it is said that Chernovol went to Maidan. Then it is said 11 o'clock in the evening, left and turned the phone off. 
So they were tracking her phone as well. They were able to tell when she had her phone on and off. You can track people by phone, yeah. right? And right after that, the time is the same. It says operation started. And it's like cleaning operation. Zachistka, it's cleaning operation. Okay. The thing is that Chernovol, Tatiana, was beaten in th these dates in December, and the time is the same. In the time when she was chased by three men and when she was beaten, it's the same like in notes of Yanukovych's head of, uh, of security. Sign of a very paranoid human being. Imagine he was so afraid that somebody will take a look inside Mezhihiria. Yeah. Now we are sitting with you here. Four days after the revolution, an interim government was formed with the consent of the protesters, composed of opposition MPs and major protest figures. The protesters' victory was barely a week old, but already the country and its new government were under threat. Russia responded to the revolution by invading Ukraine's Crimea Peninsula. Clearly, the Ukrainian military was not able to stand up to the Russians, so the government announced the creation of the National Guard to bolster the understrength military. The National Guard would stand as a reserve force drawn from Ukrainian civilians, many of them protesters who had fought on the Maidan. We managed to blag our way onto one of the buses heading to Novi Patrizzi, which is where the National Guard training area is. We're with the Lviska Sotnia, which so these guys are from Western Ukraine, from Lviv. I'm hoping that they haven't mistaken me for a recruit, but I guess we'll find out when we get there. So the Sotnias are now moving out onto a training field. Now there's about five of them here now. They're going to get barracks here on this base for, for two weeks, and it seems like for their arrival, the army have got a, like a fireworks show in form of artillery for them. I guess, yeah, this is what they'll be training with over the next couple of weeks. You've got like smaller versions of the AK-47, pretty standard around these parts. Pistols, the shotguns, even sniper rifles. A lot of them seem to already know how to take them apart and put them back together, so obviously some of them have had military training before. It's very, very different to a shield and a club from the Maidan. This is uh, real war stuff now. So, Taras, what do you what do you make of all, nope. all these weapons here? I mean, have you ever seen anything like this before? Yeah, no, never. I first uh, first time see even these, these weapons that was shooting on us and uh, barricades. You never can even imagine that they will stand in the same base where these people were trained. Are you at all nervous about possibly facing? Russian aggression, the Russian military. I think all these people that were standing on the barricades without a weapon against the government understand this duty. We must be like one, uh, one body against uh, Russian aggression. If it will be some war, we of course will protect our country to the death. But uh, we understand that we must uh, stay alive and build new country. These guys, a lot of them don't have military experience and possibly they'll be up against the might of the Russian military machine. It looks a bit desperate, but it's all they've got for now. These guys aren't afraid. They're very determined to protect their country. A few days later, and a day after Russia formally annexed the Crimea, a tour of the base had been organized for the international press to have a sneak peek at the National Guard as they tested out their newly acquired RPG skills. Andrew Paraby, the, the head of the self-defense groups, which these guys mainly come from. He's now uh, the head of the National Defense uh, Security Council. So he was actually the guy that announced the creation of the National Guard to help the uh, Ukrainian military. So he's now here, getting to see them in action. With this training, do you think you'll be ready to fight the Russian army if they invade? Do you feel it's your patriotic duty to join the National Guard to defend your country? Как гражданин Украины, не только тут, как гражданин, я считаю, что каждый гражданин Украины обязан защищать границы своего государства. It's clear that the Ukrainian government needs these guys to help bolster their very understrength military, but 
there could be a downside to arming and training large groups of the population because these guys could come back and haunt them. It took four months and over 100 deaths that the Euromaidan protesters were finally able to topple Viktor Yanukovych. It's difficult to imagine that in the 21st century, so many people would be gunned down in the streets of a European city, but those killed would be remembered as heroes who helped give ordinary Ukrainians a better chance for the future. One of the key demands of the revolution were new presidential elections. Whoever wins will have a tough time juggling the economy, the pro-Russian rebels in the East, and an empowered population willing to take back to the streets if they fail to act against the corruption that started the revolution that ended Yanukovych's kleptocratic regime.